Safety. It seems to be a hot button topic these days, especially between the aero modeling community and the FAA. But what is safety and how can you calculate the level of risk you take when you fly a model aircraft? I'm Alex Grieve, president of the FPVTA, and I am here to explain to you what is safety and how you can calculate the risk of colliding with a full-scale aircraft. First thing we have to do is define safety. Webster's definition defines safety as free from risk or harm. Now, completely free of risk or harm, that seems to be a tall order. I mean, I could walk outside right now and get struck by lightning, but the probability of that is quite low. So that's not gonna keep me from going outside, but there is certainly a risk there, it's just very low. So when we talk about safety, what we're talking about is an acceptable level of risk. Well, what is an acceptable level of risk and how do you calculate it? Well, you need to know two things. One, the probability of an event occurring. And number two, the consequences of that event should it come true. Now in calculating the probability of a collision, depending on whether you use historical data or the big sky concept, you'll come to a figure somewhere between one in 38 million to one in 31.7 million. That's fairly low. Well, let's put that into perspective. You are more likely, in fact, you are nine times more likely to be injured by your toilet the next time you use it than you are of an aircraft striking your model. Don't believe me? Look it up. Okay, so humorous, but it illustrates a point. There aren't very many people getting injured by toilets. But is it an acceptable level of risk? Of course, we could be injured by the toilet, but that's not exactly going to stop us from using it. Just like you have a probability of 2200 to one of dying in your shower. Now, maybe you're afraid of that and you'd rather take a bath, in which case your risk is down to about one in 500,000. There's still some risk involved, but then again, I don't think we're going to stop bathing because there is a risk of something even as tragic as death in that. So, how do you calculate, how did I come up with these numbers of one in 38 and one in 31.7 million? Well, simple, history. The easiest way to do that is history. Well, in the past 20 years, we've had one collision between an aircraft, full scale, and a model. It was a giant scale model that was struck by a biplane 20 feet off the deck. Now, the biplane's wing was damaged. However, it was able to land safely. So, nobody died. We simply caused a fair amount of damage to the biplane, which could be repaired. Still not preferable, but it did happen. There are approximately three to 5,000 model aircraft flights per day in the United States, yet we've only had one collision. So if you multiply that number, 5,000 times 20 years, times 365 days per year, you get a figure of one collision in 38 million flights. That is incredibly low. That's very safe. So, what's another way to calculate it? There's this, con the big sky concept works great. Well, we know that there's a certain volume of air a model could possibly be located in. And what it's determined by is frequency, transmitter power, receiver sensitivity, and the resident noise floor. Now, under ideal conditions, most models can take up approximately 12 cubic miles of airspace. That's what your receiver antenna can see based on most FPV systems. Now, I know what you're thinking. I mean, certain antennas do get you further away. Yes, they get you further away, but they don't make that volume of air any larger. They simply change its shape. So, interestingly enough, 12 cubic miles is what a cylinder 500 feet high with a radius of two miles would be. Interestingly enough, that seems to be where most modelers can find their aircraft. In fact, very few even pass one mile of flight on most of their flights. So this seems to be a fairly good approximation of where the model would be. Where in this shape? Well, we don't really know. It could be anywhere. 
but we're going to assume it's more likely that an aircraft is going to hit a model than a model is going to hit the aircraft. Besides, if the model hits the aircraft, it's probably going to do absolutely nothing other than maybe make a thump. So how do we know what the probability is? Well, I said 500 feet. I'm giving myself two miles and 500 feet. Why? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, a property line is technically extends 500 feet above the tallest structure. So for private property, you technically own 500 feet above your tallest structure. Also, the FAA suggests that you may not fly within 500 feet of a person or structure. You are not also not allowed to fly below 500 feet of altitude except for over the water and very sparsely populated areas. So this 500 feet seems to be accepted by the FAA and the property line as where you're really not supposed to operate a full-scale aircraft. However, aircraft do need to take off and land, so obviously a certain portion of their time is going to be operated in this space. But because they're not supposed to operate there regularly, in fact they're not supposed to be operated there except for takeoff and landing, we're going to assume that the airplane pilots are abiding by their own laws and we will abide by ours. So if you take the 14,000 airports in the United States and factor in the size of the United States at 3.8 million square miles, you're going to come to one in 274 square miles where you find an airport. Now we're going for worst case so that statistic doesn't really apply. Let's say you're going to operate within three miles of an airport. So you're going to operate where the flight path could possibly intersect, where planes are taking off and landing. So you're eliminating all the probability where you're nowhere to be found. We have this five, uh, we have this 500 foot tall, two mile radius cylinder. The plane could come through anywhere in that and also the model could be located anywhere. So we're going to assume that the path the airliner takes is not through the center and not through the edge, but somewhere in between, so the path is approximately two miles long. In other words, the airplane is going to come in approximately two miles through your airspace. Now your model could be anywhere in there, but let's focus on the air airplane. All right, so what is the average size of an airplane? Well, we need to calculate the frontal area and we're gonna use an Embraer passenger jet. Of course, we could use a 737 or a 747, but the truth is, is most flights aren't actually commercial, they're actually just private airplanes, which are significantly smaller than a passenger jet. But a passenger jet seems to be in the middle. And a passenger jet, the Embraer, has a frontal area of approximately 125 square feet. So the jet on a two mile trajectory at a 125 square feet uses up a volume of air equal to nine millionths of one cubic mile. Now your volume of air that you're operating in is 12 cubic miles. Now the probability of your aircraft being anywhere in that aircraft's flight path is one in 1.4 million. Now that's at any given Time. Now we have to factor time into this. We know approximately the number of flights made, and if you divide the number of flights made by the number of airports in the United States, you will come to one flight in every 6.7 hours. Now, we also need to know the time at which this flies. Now this helicopter flies for maybe six to seven minutes as compared to this airplane could fly for approximately half an hour. But the average flight of a model is approximately 12 minutes at max. Sure, some fly longer, many fly shorter, but we're going to use 12 minutes, which is one fifth of an hour. Now, so you're going to need to multiply your figure by not only five for the amount of time that you will fly, but also by 6.7 as the probability that in that same, in that hour, a, an airplane will fly through your airspace. And what you're going to come to is one in 31.7 million. Now, as you know, this is nine times less likely than being injured by your toilet the next time you use it. But 
That doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. I mean, it's just a random statistic. Well, how about a real statistic? What is an acceptable level of risk to take? Well, why don't we try a natural, a, a, why don't we experiment with a true disaster? Say a nuclear bomb explosion. What is the US government's acceptable probability of a nuclear device detonating in the event of a problem? Now, it's not like this never happened. In fact, in 1958, Bombay doors opened on an airplane and two four megaton bombs were dropped in North Carolina. That's four megatons, not weight. That's equal to four million tons of TNT. A detonation of those devices would simply wipe out all of North Carolina and turn it into a bay while the debris would fly over Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, and South Carolina, and parts of Georgia, turning them into complete rubble fields and destroying most of what's there, not to mention the fallout. Really high risk, right? Well, why didn't that happen? Well, low voltage arming switch on the bombs was not engaged, and therefore, though everything failed, that low voltage arming switch is the reason why North Carolina is still there and the mountains of Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, aren't three times as high and radioactive. But what was the acceptable level of risk that those would actually go off? One in one million. 31 times higher than the probability of an airplane striking this. We're talking about leveling five states. And that's 31 times more likely and considered acceptable than an airplane contacting this, yet no airplane has ever been downed by a model. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out why those companies are able to do this. It's simple. They have a lot of this, a lot of money. They simply paid for a lobby that granted them the ability to fly. And the FAA has simply said, have ma they made their case against the FAA and won, and now the FAA allows them to operate for commercial purposes. But does having a lot of this make you any safer than if you're simply flying this? No, it doesn't. In fact, if you're flying commercially, you're more likely to take a higher risk because you are trying to get a goal accomplished for pay. There is this on the line, after all. And we at the FPVTA are doing our absolute best to keep that from happening. We want you to have a right to fly unrestricted. And that is our position. And that is why we are supporting the Academy of Model Aeronautics and their lawsuit against the FAA and their interpretation of the special rule, which says, which the, the FAA states that FPV is illegal by donating $1,000 to their campaign. And should they run out, we will open up our wallets and donate more of this so that you have the right to fly this without restriction. I'm Alex Grieve and keep them flying.